Have you got questions about Christianity? About God? About Jesus? The big questions of life? Or maybe your friends have been talking to you about your faith over the last few months. Well, if that's the case, we'd like to invite you and your friends along to uh, Christianity Explored. It is a seven week course, which is beginning in a few weeks time on the 16th of August. We're running it in conjunction with a couple of churches in Dundee and Fife. And it's an opportunity uh, and a safe space where we can dig a little deeper into the Gospel of Mark, uh, a biography about the life of Jesus with eyewitness testimonies from those who lived with him and heard from him. Uh, it's a chance where we can learn a bit more about who he is, why he came, and what he calls us to do in response. If that's you, we'd love for you to come. Uh, the details uh, about the event uh, will come up on the slide afterwards. There'll also be the email of our minister uh, if you would like to come yourself or if you've got friends that you're interested in inviting. I know for me, before I became a Christian, I would have loved this opportunity. So please don't let it pass you by now. Good morning, all of you. My name is Alberto. I'm the minister here of Brotiferi Presbyterian Church, and we are gathering together this morning as we come to worship our God. If you are a visitor and this is your first time or if you've popped in a few times, uh, we're delighted that you are either coming for the first time or you decide to come back. And once again, for all the members and anyone else, if you want to get in touch with us later on about the service, about the sermon, or any question you have about Christian life, and, or you want to uh, uh, speak to someone and to have a prayer time with them, so please do get in touch with us. As we come, we come in the presence of a holy God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We do it imperfect as we are, but relying on God's mercy, his faithfulness to draw us close to him through Jesus Christ, his son. So that's our confidence that God has put everything in place for us to share together this moment in worship in praise, thanksgiving, prayer and adoration to his name. So let's sing together, Jesus is Lord.
Let us join together in prayer. Dear God and Father, here we are in your majestic presence. You are our Father of light, the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, our Lord and King. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, from whom we receive all wisdom, guidance, and nurturing. Thank you for allowing us to gather together in the name of Jesus before you, O Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. O dear God, it is a delight to be in this place. It is a delight to be in your presence. It is a joy that is beyond understanding because undeserving as we are, yet you have given us everything in Christ. You have covered us with your mercy. You have lavished your love upon us. You have forgiven those who are actually unforgivable, Lord. And you have drawn us close to you without harming us, without hurting us, without condemning us, bringing all the judgment upon Jesus for us to be found safe, protected, warmly welcomed in your presence. So we praise you, Father, and we bow down before you. This is an act of worship where we gather together to serve you. So we are here not to be served. And we thank you for the so many blessings that you have given us over the past week, over the past years, your protection, your guidance, your provision, how you've given us uh, uh, jobs and, and uh, uh, the, what we need on a day-to-day -day basis to live and to live not only for the enjoyment of our own lives, but to live for you. Thank you for the church, for our brothers and sisters for this family we belong to that is greater, way beyond the boundaries of our local congregation. Thank you for being with us, for walking with us, for taking us by the hand and leading us as, Lord, we continue to come closer and closer to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Um, I get the privilege of doing a, a talk for you guys today, and I hope you're doing well. Hope you're having a nice summer so far. And I wanted to talk to you today about new things and old things. I wonder if you've had a birthday, maybe, and you got some new toys, or you're thinking back to Christmas when you got some new presents, and it's so exciting when you get new stuff. I really really like getting new things um, and I can remember some of the things that I had once that I was really excited about. This was, believe it or not, mine a few years ago and this is a mobile phone. Now at the time I was super excited about this but you look at it now, yeah it doesn't have a touch screen, it doesn't actually work anymore um, so I can't call anyone on it, I can't text, I can't go on Facebook or do anything. So it was really good once, but it's not really any use now. So yeah, I can't really use it, which is a shame. A bit like this camera. A long time ago, I got this camera, um, I think for my birthday, and it was great to do loads of photos with it, but you know, it's got a bit old and actually the, the lens is a bit broken now, so I can't take any pictures on it at all. So. Again, something that I was really excited about, something that was great at the time, but it, it doesn't really work anymore. It's not anything that I can use. And some even older things. This is a really old fishing reel. I'll take it out and show you. This was actually my dad's. And I have it now, but it's, it's a really complicated old piece of fishing equipment. And I love to go fishing, but I can't really use this reel anymore because it's it's too old, it just, it doesn't work. And it's really just kept as, a, as an ornament. It's not something that I can use anymore. And even in our house that we live in, oh, pull this up, our house had this, which was um, an old 
bell system um, that people could ring bells in different parts of the house, um, maybe just to, to find out where someone was. And it's a, it's a lovely old thing, but it doesn't work anymore. It's not anything that we can use in our house. Um, so a nice thing to have, but it's, it's not really of any worth because things change and believe it or not, this guy here, that was me a few years ago and you can definitely see things have changed. I don't think nature's maybe been too kind to me. But it reminded me of a, a verse, uh, it's a verse that Alberto is going to be speaking to the grown-ups about later um, in Matthew's Gospel where it speaks about heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. And there's a song about that. There's a song that says, yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus is the same. We know um, when we read our Bibles and we know more about who God is, that God does not change. He was, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But what it says in God's word is that this world that we're in won't be here forever. That There'll be a, a new heaven and a new earth and this will happen once Jesus returns. And that's something that as Christians we believe in. It's really important for us to believe in that and understand that. And it's something as children that you can ask your mummy and daddy about. And the best answer that can be given is put your trust in Jesus. Trust in him. Trust in him. And then you can look forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Because all the old things, all the things that we have here Will pass away. Um, all the toys that you have now, maybe in a year's time you won't play with anymore. Um, maybe, like me, you once had a full head of hair and there's not much up there anymore now. Um, so things do change, but we know that we can trust in God. We know that we can trust in his word because he doesn't change. And we know that we can trust that one day Jesus will come back and we will be with him in heaven where there will be no pain, no sickness, no sorrow, and no death, which is a wonderful thing um, for us as Christians to have and to trust in. So I hope you, you've listened to that. If you have any questions, you can speak to a grown-up about that. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. And we're going to sing a, a song now um, and the words and the music will come up uh, shortly. Thanks. See you soon. Bye. This just in, Jesus is coming back. We are looking forward to a better day. When all pain and crying is taken away. Saved us for it.
The Old Testament lesson is taken from Psalm 29, the 29th Psalm. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as King forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Amen. And may God bless to us this reading of his holy word. Good morning. At this point in our service, let us come together before God to confess our sins, and to intercede for other people and ourselves as well. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, who together with your Son Jesus and the Holy Spirit are three persons, yet one God, we bow our heads humbly before your great and mighty good and merciful being. We bow before you knowing that in and of ourselves we are not fit for your company because we sin against you daily. We must use our minds to think thoughts which would fill us with shame if made public. We must use our tongues to say things that are neither true nor helpful and are quick to condemn other people for the very same wrongs we do ourselves. We must use our lives by being selfish and not living to glorify you, who are our Lord and our God. Hypocrisy and inconsistency mark and mar so much of our so-called best actions. If you were to keep our record of our wrongs, who among us could stand as unblemished and uncondemned in your eyes? But yet with you we have forgiveness, we have redemption, not through our efforts, but through the perfect sacrifice of our Lord Jesus on the cross. By the shedding of his blood, 
to remove all our iniquities, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in our place condemned he stood, sealed our pardon with his blood. Hallelujah! What a saviour! As a people bought by the precious blood of Jesus, you now give us work to do and duties to fulfil. You have made us a kingdom of priests, all of us together calling upon you in prayer and interceding for others. We bring before you our Christian brothers and sisters in northern Nigeria, many of whom are experiencing severe and bloody persecution at the hands of followers of our rival religion. Lord, may your Holy Spirit comfort them in their afflictions and encourage them to look to Jesus, who is interceding for them, even now before your throne. We pray for our fellow believers in China, where the godless Marxist government is cracking down on them and taking away their freedom to worship you, where their government is encouraging them to turn away from Christ and make the state their God, otherwise they will be severely penalised. Father, keep them faithful to Christ, even unto death for you've promised to give them the crown of life. Lord, as we come near to the sixth anniversary of the founding of our congregation, help us during the difficulties and restrictions, the fears and anxieties of this current COVID-19 lockdown. Keep us faithful to Christ, our King and Head. Help us give frequent thanks to you for your faithfulness, your protection, and your provision over these years, and strengthen us for the future by your word and spirit to continue trusting and obeying you until you call each of us home or until our Lord Jesus returns to gather all his people to himself. And we ask all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
The New Testament lesson is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 32 to 35. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, reading from verses 32 to 35. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and it puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Amen, and may God bless to us the reading of his holy word. So thank you, Craig, for reading the passages for us. As we come before uh, God's word, let's say a short prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word, this living, powerful word. And we pray, Lord, for your spirit to apply these words into our hearts for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When daffodils start to bloom, it's a sign that spring is on its way. We are used to season cycles uh, with their respective signs pointing out to the arrival of the next. We still talk about seasonal fruit and vegetables, which will be cheaper, by the way. I'm just wondering if Jesus were British, instead of talking about fig trees, he would then probably be talking about daffodils or any other fruit tree or any other vegetable or any other flower that would mark the, the beginning that would foreshadow the beginning, the start of a new season. In order to understand this short passage, we, uh, we need to go back to what we have already learned for, for the moment, okay? So it is all the way from the beginning of chapter 24, and this teaching from Jesus was prompted by the disciples' questions about when all those things that Jesus started to talk, to talk about were going to happen. And it goes all the way into the end of chapter 25. So Jesus is addressing those questions. So what is it that we know so far? Well, we know that this is Jesus' last discourse. This is the, Jesus' last uh, teaching session, as it were, in Matthew's Gospel. And here, Jesus is predicting a series of events that will precede the coming of the Son of Man with glory in that last day, the day of the Lord, as it is called in other parts of Scripture. So, what is he predicting? Well, he's predicting intense suffering upon the church and the world. So he's talking about persecutions, false prophets, false Christs, earthquakes, wars, and famines. I'm not going to go into detail about this anymore. We've already covered that in previous sermons. He's also predicting events more closely related to Jerusalem and the temple. And here you have a parallel between what happened there and then, and how that points out to something still to happen in a future unknown to us. So he talks about the destruction of the city and all that is involved, the desecration of the temple, as well as the arrival of a person known as the abomination of desolation. And Jesus says, beware when you see these things happening. He's also predicting the preaching of the gospel to all nations. And then, and then in the end, there will be the culmination of all that with his return in glory to be with his elect people. Well, how are we making sense of all those predictions? Uh, I've been speaking about this, about double or partial fulfillment of the prophetic words of Jesus Christ because that's the best way to understand and to make sense how those words that Jesus is saying to his own disciples were relevant to them, 
there and then, as well as they are relevant to us, now here, 2,000 years later. So, there has been a partial fulfillment of Jesus' predictions with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in the year 70 AD. It's happened, and yet it points to something else. That is a continuous fulfillment of those predictions with the persecution of Christians throughout the ages, with a succession of wars, famine, etc., between Jesus' first and Jesus' second coming. And there is an expectation of a last upsurge of evil against God's people that will be brought to an end by Jesus' dramatic and instant return. So this is so far we, what we have managed to see in Matthew 24. All this helps us to understand a tricky word here in our passage, which is the word generation. So Jesus says in verse 34, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away. What does he mean by that? Because if it is simply that generation there and then, then Jesus got it wrong. But the apostolic testimony in Matthew's Gospel, as well as in the letters, Paul in particular, uh, have no indication that Jesus has got it wrong. Some liberal commentators, that's where they, well, that's what the conclusion is, and they will see that here's a, a mistake in the Bible. And I wonder why people would put, you know, such a blunt mistake uh, just for others to uh, single out and have a, a, a have a, a way of, of attacking us or, or, or challenging our, our Christian faith. But thankfully, there are other ways, biblical ways, logical ways to understand this word here without actually having to resort to simply saying he got it wrong. Actually, in a more biblical and logical way, there are five ways to interpret this word here. From what we have just outlined and the most natural sense of the passage, uh, it has to involve the present generation. Jesus is indeed speaking to his own disciples and to his own followers there and then. But, it also, but also it has to involve those who will see the coming of Jesus. Because the coming of Jesus here, as he predicted, is not the coming of the Holy Spirit, is not the coming of Jesus after resurrection. It is a glorious coming. It has the angels collecting people from all over the earth and gathering them as God's people uh, for that final event before evil goes away and the kingdom is solidly established. So, the generation... Uh, of the disciples of those days, they did not see most of those events. Uh, sorry, they did see actually most of those events with the exception of the preaching of the gospel to all nations and the actual return of Jesus Christ. As for the preaching of the gospel, they were on the move with that. By the time Matthew wrote his gospel, so the church had already spread from uh, Jerusalem and to uh, Judea and Samaria and to the north uh, as well as to the west into the Roman world as we see that in the Acts of the Apostles and the church continues to do so in our own times. But the return of Jesus, well that's something still to happen. So the word generation here involves the actual disciples of those days, as well as believers throughout the entire present age. Because generation can be read in a different uh, 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 ways, not exactly the literal meaning, the generation of this time. For example, in Psalm 14, verse 5, we read, For God is with the generation of the righteous. Well, who is the generation of the righteous in, in Psalm 14, verse 5? Well, actually, it's not generation that is measured by time, but
but is generation that is measured by kind. So generations sometimes refer to people who have a certain quality. And when you have that in mind, and when we have that, there is still a prophetic fulfillment to come uh, to the fore. You read this verse and it seems to, to fit in. Truly, I say to you, this generation, the generation of the righteous, the generation of those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So after unpacking that, Jesus then uses the fig tree as an illustration to reassure his disciples that his predictions are reliable, as reliable as all his other teachings. Jesus' teachings are reliable when he speaks about ethics. Jesus' teachings are reliable when he speaks about the condition of the human heart. Jesus' teachings are reliable when he tells us about the kingdom of God and its nature uh, uh, and its spiritual nature. Jesus' teachings are reliable when he speaks about the future as well. Unfortunately, those who go after a deeper knowledge of the fig tree's biology, trying to find an equivalence with human history, are missing the point here. Earlier this morning, this is an old, you know, when I was a teenager, there was a, 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 a praise group. And I was just listening, you know, because... Sometimes I feel that nostalgia, it's good, you know, to go back and to think of good times, you know, you had in the past. And, but then I was analyzing what they were singing. The guy was singing, you know, when the fig tree bears its fruit, it's a sign that Jesus is coming back. Well, actually, that's not what the passage is saying here. There is no direct correlation with a particular fig tree or fig orchard uh, bearing fruit in Israel with the specific day of Jesus' return. Jesus is using here uh, the fig tree as an illustration. So that's why, what he's saying here. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. The word here for lesson is the word elsewhere in the Bible, which translate as a parable. So it's very clear here that Jesus is not being literal. He's using something that's common to his people in order to convey some spiritual, deeper message about his return. And the comparison is quite simple. Nature gives us signs of the arrival of a season. The coming of Jesus also is being preceded by signs. Many of them are already there. Well, we've seen wars and rumors of wars. We have seen famines. We have seen the gospel uh, being preached uh, through, uh, throughout the world, even if it's coming through and, and, and or if it, it has the opposition of, of people and other ideologies and persecution and so many Christians martyred. So some of the signs are already happening. Many of them and others still need to happen. That is the final great tribulation and the manifestation of that Antichrist. And that specific Antichrist, okay? Not Antichrists as you read them in first, the first letter of John. A specific, the Antichrist still to come, as well as the immediate signs of his immediate return, imminent return. So the question Jesus is answering here is, uh, are your words trustworthy? Can we trust you, Jesus, with all those predictions? Can we trust you with all the signs you are uh, enlisting before us and to realize that you are actually saying the truth to us? And the answer is yes. Of course, they are trustworthy. First, because the signs are there. By the time Matthew is writing his gospel, he had seen a lot of persecution, a lot of the spreading of the gospel, a lot of wars and rumors of wars. He had seen some of those signs being confirmed according to the word of Jesus Christ. So his word is trustworthy, is faithful and true because the signs are happening and more are yet 
to come. Second, even if we couldn't see a clear evidence about the signs, the, as the divine Son of God, Jesus is the guarantor of such promises. And that means that the weight of his words are superior. His word is superior to those words in the Torah, the Torah, the, the books of the law. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says that all that is in the Torah will be fulfilled. So he's not dismissing Old Testament and he's not dismissing the law as irrelevant anymore. He's saying, I have come to fulfill it, to, to fulfill it, to bring it into, mani to, to, to manifest all its meaning, all its promises. I am, he would say, the fulfillment of all of that. But his words are even more encompassing. Whereas the Torah is fulfilled by Christ, the words of Christ are even weightier, are even far superior than what is limited by those five books. And second, the weight of, of Jesus' words are superior to those words of the prophets. Not because of a difference of content, but because of the source of authority. No true prophet in the Old Testament would come declaring uh, 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 his uh, utterances in his own name. Uh, because with regards to the authority, the prophets always would come saying, thus says the Lord. And that's what we've been seeing uh, for over, I think, 14 weeks. Uh, through uh, the book of Ezekiel. And thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. And that's the weight of the prophetic word of prophet Ezekiel, as well as all the other prophets. Whereas Jesus, he never speaks on behalf of anyone. You don't hear Jesus say, thus says the Lord. He says, truly I say to you, because Jesus is like the Father, he is the Amen. He is the I Am with the authority to convey his revelation, to manifest his word as he's seeing, as he's doing here. So the signs are there. Jesus is reliable. As the divine Son of God, he is reliable. He is the Son of God, the guarantor of such promises. Now, what are the lessons then to be learned from this passage? Learn from the fig tree. When uh, its branches become tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. When the signs are there, you know what the signs are pointing to. So what to be learned here? To be learned here. Well, first, back to the word of Christ that the word of Jesus is the word of God, that it stands the test of times, because he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And that it's been proven to be reliable, because the signs are happening. And second, the signs serve the purpose of preparation. And... Don't remember exactly the day, but it was December 1941. Uh, President Roosevelt then would call that a day of infamy. That's when the Japanese uh, uh, fleet attacked and crippled the American uh, Navy stationed at Pearl Harbor. But consider this, what if they knew the attack was going to happen, what would, have, what would have they done? And this is what Jesus is asking you here. If you knew that Jesus is coming, what would you do? Of course, you know, Pearl Harbor is a negative uh, uh, illustration. I'm aware of that because uh, it means that the Japanese are coming to destroy. So therefore, if I knew they are coming, I will prepare. I'll have this, the fleet ready. I'll have the planes ready. So when they start moving towards me, I will counterattack. 
and probably take them by surprise and therefore frustrate their plans. But the arrival of Jesus Christ is not a negative event. It is a very positive event indeed. So uh, think of the arrival of your friend, your savior, savior and king. What are the preparations you are making for his arrival? If you had enough clear evidence that Jesus is returning, what would you do? And I'm saying here, through the many signs and many prophecies already fulfilled and being fulfilled, that the signs are there. Would you do as much evil as possible before the inevitable? As some people say, after all, life is too short. Is that your reaction? Because it's not a reaction, you don't see Jesus as your friend. It's like, you know, let us wreck his house and let us mess this all up as much as possible, doing what we like to do, uh, because, you know, he's coming. And when he comes, well, then the part is over. Is that how you feel about him? Someone who comes to stifle and to stop the fun in life? What would you do? Would you do as much evil as possible before the inevitable? Or would you come to your senses listening and believing in his calling? And to realize that actually it is at his arrival that the party will actually going to start. That there will be joy indescribable. Joy that does not need to be fed by any kind of uh, enhancement drugs of any form. I was watching a documentary about uh, 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 drugs and the specialist was saying a few words about cocaine and cocaine gives, you know, the first take such a sense of euphoria. And then she says, that sense of euphoria and well-being will never, ever repeat again. And the person is hooked up into a frustrating search for that sensation once again that never happens again. So would you come to your senses listening and believing in his calling in order to enjoy the true joy, in order to, to, to experience the true joy, in order to actually realize that life is so much better with him than without? Because after all, he is my friend, he is my savior, he is my king, the one I long for to come. Come, Lord Jesus, as in the Bible we hear the word Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Would you continue to persevere? Thinking about you who are already a believer, would you continue to persevere? Because among the things that will happen between the first and second coming of Jesus Christ, you have this uh, stifling or, or, or the cooling down of people's ability to be loving and kind to one another. And that's because of the increase of lawlessness, says Jesus in his prophecy. We've already tackled that in other sermons. Would you persevere? Would you continue to persevere, not allowing his love in your heart to grow cold? Pay attention to the lesson. See that the signs are all there. Make preparations then, because he is coming indeed. And be that generation, not in time, but that kind of generation that will feel that wonderful sense of delight at his coming. So the signs are there. Jesus is the guarantor of these promises. His word is faithful and true. They will not pass away. If the signs are there, and if you know from nature uh, if you know how to learn from nature, how to do things in preparation for the arrival of a new season, 
be prepared and ready in the right way for the arrival of the risen, glorious King Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Uh, thank you, Father, for your word and for your blessings in this word. And we pray, God and Father, that your people will indeed be fed, that your spirit will apply these words, that these words will convey comfort to some, as well, Lord, will convey discomfort to others who think life can be too comfortable without considering your reality and the coming of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that your instruction will continue to guide us in order for us to uh, walk with Jesus, even when, when time comes for us to walk through the narrow way and to go through the narrow gate, always taking up our cross and following him. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing, and we're going to sing the words of Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation. A fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lives like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness. I'll look to Him who hears me. Oh, praise Him.
And now go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord is coming. The love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you now and forever. Amen. God bless you.